Welcome everyone. This is the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County's lecture series presenting investigative genetic genealogy with Barbara Ray Venter. This event is being recorded and it's going to be available for 30 days on the SCPL YouTube channel. All handouts are available on the SCPL event page. So if you go back to that page where you registered, you'll now see in that gray box where it says attachments and you'll see this giant red arrow pointing to it. So if you click on that, that's a PDF of all of the handouts. And yes, we do have a YouTube channel through the library and we'll put that link in the chat for you as well. If you're having trouble with bandwidth today, you can join this event using a telephone only. So you can dial one of the four numbers up on the screen. I'll read a couple of them aloud. It's 1-888-788-0099. And then you'll enter the webinar ID of 8816967-5181. And just in case you missed it, the red arrow that's pointing to the gray box, that link, it's for the attachments for today's program. So if you go to the event page for today's event, yeah, you won't be able to read it, but just know that if you go to today's event page and click on that link, you will be able to open the attachments. And we are taking questions, so if you're joining by a computer, down on your Zoom control bar that's generally at the bottom of your screen, you'll find the Q&A icon. Clicking that will allow you to type in your question, and we'll take those at the end of Barbara's presentation. And then if you're on a mobile device, the Q&A icon likely appears near the top right corner of your screen, so you'll see it up in that upper right portion. I'm now going to turn things over to Gail Burke. Gail, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon. We are glad to see all of you here for today's program. This program is presented in partnership with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries on the library's Zoom meetings platform. We thank our library partners, Sarah Jones, Victor Willis, and Jessica Goodman for their assistance in supporting our programs. In a moment, we'll get to today's presentation, but first though, we have a few announcements. The Society's Irish Special Interest Group will meet on Tuesday, May 9, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. It will meet in person in the upstairs meeting room at the downtown library. And we're gonna pause here for a moment because we have a poll and we want to know how you would like to participate in the Irish Special Interest Group going forward. So Sarah, could you put up the poll real quickly? It says, if you plan to participate in the Irish SIG, which option works best for you? One Monday evening per month via Zoom beginning at 7.30, one Sunday afternoon per month in person in the genealogy room at the downtown branch library, or either one is fine. So this, you only need to respond if you plan to participate in the program. Thank you, Sarah. Let's give a few moments for people to respond and I'll let you uh, keep a tally of the poll results. I will continue with the announcements. Annette Hagopian will host the Society's Ice Cream Social on Wednesday, May 10th <clears throat> at 2 p.m. at her home, <clears throat> pardon me, at 1408 Broadway in Santa Cruz. <clears throat> the social is open to all society members and will honor the society's volunteers for the current year. So come join us and learn how you too can volunteer and be celebrated with ice cream. The Santa Cruz County History Fair <clears throat> will take place in Felton on Saturday, May 13th from 1 to 5 p.m. at the Felton Community Hall. Local museums, historical societies, and other groups will have displays and activities at the event. In conjunction with the History Fair, there will also be a series of history lectures at the Felton Branch Library Community Room. The Society's DNA Special Interest Group will meet next on Tuesday, June 6th from 10 a.m. to noon. The DNA Special Interest Group meets in person in the upstairs meeting room at the downtown library. A new activity, Genealogists Helping Genealogists, will begin Wednesday, June 14th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. in the genealogy room at the downtown library. This will be a monthly activity every second Wednesday of the month. Contact Leslie Losey for details. 
And as I've been telling you, we have our own version of hybrid programming. We invite you to join us in the upstairs meeting room to watch all our regular programs on the large monitor. Society members are available after the programs to answer questions that attendees might have. It's a fun way to participate in the Zoom programs in person. For details, contact Mike Epperson or join us at 1 p.m. in the library meeting room. There will be cookies. In the meeting room during our June program, Debbie Muth will have an assortment of donated genealogy books available. These books are duplicate materials of items in our collection and they are looking for new homes. So come early in person to the June meeting and adopt a book or 10. Book browsing begins at 1230. You can contact Debbie Muth for details. Here's the important announcement. The society will elect officers in June for the coming year. We have been fortunate that so many of our stalwart longtime members have served on the board for years, literally through fire and flood, not to mention the pandemic. Officers include president, vice president, treasurer, recording secretary, corresponding secretary, three directors, and one member at large position. Please step up and run for office this year. No prior board experience is required. Meetings are only once per month. The term of office runs just for one year from July 1 through June 30th. Your society is calling for some assistance. Let us hear from you. You can contact Nancy Giroux, Mike Epperson, or Leslie Losey and indicate your interest in serving on the board for the coming year. We have some excellent upcoming programs. In June, Kathy Nielsen will present her program about what to do with our family research and heirlooms. Kathy's programs are always superb and full of good ideas. In September, Janelle Davidson, certified genealogist, will explain strategies we can use to explore the unindexed records at Family Search. These are records that are not yet named searchable. And Janelle is an expert at finding and using many of the more obscure genealogical records. Please mark your calendars for these upcoming programs. Just a reminder, we pause our regular programming during the months of July and August. Now, today, we are very privileged to have Barbara Ray Venter as our speaker. As many of you undoubtedly already know, Ms. Ray Venter has become well known for her pioneering use of investigative genetic genealogy in criminal cases, both to help identify unidentified human remains and also to help law enforcement identify murderers. Her work to identify the mother of a child abducted in infancy and later abandoned and her later work to identify the abductor of that child, a murderer who killed the Allentown Four in New Hampshire, was groundbreaking. Perhaps though, Barbara Ray Venter is best known here for her work in helping to identify the notorious Golden State Killer in California. Barbara Ray Venter, JD, PhD, is the Director of Investigative Genetic Genealogy at Gene by Gene. She is also the president and founder of Firebird Forensics Group, Inc., a nonprofit corporation that focuses on assisting law enforcement with identifying suspects in violent crimes and identifying unidentified human remains. For her work, Barbara was recognized by the journal Nature as one of 10 people who matter in science in 2018. She was also recognized as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2019. Barbara is a retired intellectual property attorney who specialized in the patent patenting of biotechnology inventions. She earned a JD from the University of Texas at Austin Law School and a BA double major in psychology and biochemistry with special projects and a PhD in biology with a biochemistry emphasis at the University of California at San Diego. Please join me in giving Barbara Ray Venter a very warm Zoom welcome. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you.
All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, welcome to Investigative Genetic Genealogy, and I am Barbara Ray Venter. Um, just to, for full disclosure, I am the Director of Investigative Genetic Genealogy at Gene by Gene, which is the parent company of Family Tree DNA and president and co-founder of Firebird Forensics Group. Um, just uh, a quickie summary, since Gail has already gone through it, um, I have a PhD in biology from UC San Diego and a law degree from uh, the School of Law at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I've actually been an investigative genetic genealogist since 2015, even though I actually retired in 2005 from being a biotechnology patent attorney. Uh, I actually specialized in doing biotech patents. One of the better known was probably the Flavor Saver Tomato, uh, which was a patent that I uh, worked on on behalf of CalGene, which was a little biotech company up in Davis. Um, they were eventually purchased by Monsanto. Um, and then prior to that, I was a cancer researcher and then an assistant professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas. So in terms of my investigative genetic genealogy experience, I first solved my first criminal case uh, back in 2016. Uh, the, I assisted on uh, identifying the Golden State Killer in 2018. And since then, my group and I have solved approximately another 65 cases. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact that the Golden State Killer case has had um, on law enforcement in general. Um, this case um, was I worked on with uh, what we called ourselves Team Justice. This was a little plaque that I was given by Anne-Marie Schubert, uh, who was the district attorney for Sacramento, who actually was the lead counsel on uh, the case against Joseph D'Angelo. Um, she did an amazing job. Uh, there were nine counties that were involved. Um, and so she had to get all of those people organized um, and put on a, a fabulous trial. Uh, it's not easy to get lawyers to play well together. And she did a very good job of doing that. So in that little picture there is uh, what we called ourselves, the GSK team. Uh, the inset picture is um, Melissa Pariso, she was, she's now a, not in the LA office, she's in Boston, I believe, but she was with the FBI. Um, above her, from left to right, we have um, Monica Shazowski, who was from the Sacramento DA's office. Next to her, looking very FBI-ish, is Steve Kramer, uh, who was also in the LA office of the FBI. Uh, next is uh, Kirk Campbell. Uh, next to him is Paul, Paul Holes. Uh, he was with the Contra Costa uh, DA's office, and then uh, on the far right, myself. So the Golden State Killer uh, was actually sentenced. Uh, well, I should go back. He, he was actually arrested almost exactly five years ago on 24th of April uh, 2018. It's hard to believe it's actually been five years since he was arrested. Um, he was sentenced uh, on August 21st, 2020. Uh, he was sentenced to 11 life terms without the possibility of parole to be served consecutively, uh, plus an additional concurrent 15 life terms and an additional eight years for the use of uh, weapons in commission of those crimes. Th this case, more than any other, probably showed the power of investigative genetic genealogy. Um, it, the case itself was a 43-year-old cold case. And Paul had worked on that case for 22 years. We identified a suspect in 63 days from when we uploaded a DNA profile of the GSK to, uh, to GEDmatch. So to contrast this, with traditional investigation, this is probably one of the most expensive uh, cases in US history. So these are some of the numbers. 43 is the number of years that the case was cold um, when we uh, solved it. 
15 is the number of agencies that were involved. 650 is the number of detectives and special agents. 200,000 is the estimated number of hours that were spent on working on this case. 300 people had DNA swabs taken. 8,000 people were put under surveillance and the cost was around $10 million. Number of suspects, zero. You then contrast that with investigative genetic genealogy. There were six of us working on this case. We spent $217 on one consensual DNA kit. We worked for 63 days and we identified one suspect. So what exactly is investigative genetic genealogy? Well, I'm sure most of you probably do regular family history research. Um, we use exactly the same things that you use for doing regular family history research. Census records, you build family trees, you use newspapers, you use whatever is out there that might have information about the person that you're trying to identify. Um, the difference, of course, is that you're applying the use of DNA uh, in this process um, in trying to solve either violent crimes or identify unidentified human remains. Uh, some people refer to it as forensic genetic genealogy or even forensic investigative genetic genealogy. I prefer the term, the term investigative genetic genealogy. So there are three types of DNA that uh, can be used. Uh, one, of course, is Y-DNA. Uh, Y-DNA, only men have Y-DNA. It's passed down the direct paternal line. There's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, both men and women have mitochondrial DNA. Uh, it basically can be used for tracking the direct maternal line. And then we have autosomal DNA, and autosomal DNA can come in various types, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So if you're doing just regular genetic genealogy, so you're working on your family history research and you're using DNA, um, you probably use a combination of all three tests. Investigative genetic genealogy just uses uh, the autosomal DNA and it uses a very specific kind of autosomal DNA. Um, it can of course be augmented by the use of Y DNA to maybe help you get a surname for uh, the person you're trying to identify um, or also more rarely mitochondrial DNA. So let's sort of summarize then the different um, patterns of inheritance for the different kinds of DNA and why the autosomal DNA um, is so useful for what we're trying to do in terms of identifying people. So if we have Sun down the bottom here, um, he's of course, he's got uh, Y DNA, which he's inherited from his father who got it from his father, who got it from his father. It's passed down virtually unchanged from one generation to the next. As an aside, uh, my brothers actually have a one, one uh, a, a genetic difference of one. Uh, so there's a, a mutation that my youngest brother has that my uh, other brother does not have. Uh, mutations happen all the time. In the Y DNA, they typically happen between 400 and 600, every 400 to 600 years. So um, it's not something that happens particularly frequently. He also, of course, has some mitochondrial DNA, which is shown here. It's double stranded circular DNA. Um, and this is inherited from the mother, who inherits it from her mother, and so on up the line. Again, virtually unchanged from one generation to the next. Only women pass uh, the mitochondrial DNA on to the next generation, although there have been reports occasionally where a male has passed it on, but it's very rare. So both the Y DNA and the mitochondrial DNA then, they, they are passed on through hundreds of generations with, uh, well, with very little change in uh, the sequence information. I'm going to look at what's called the autosomal DNA. Um, and this is then chromosomes one through 22. Um, you of course also have an, another pair of chromosomes in women, that's a pair of X chromosomes. In men, it's an X and a Y chromosome. Um, but there are 22 sets of autosomes. 
they're a little different. They go through a mix and match procedure called recombination at each generation. And not only that, every child gets a different random mix of their parents' DNA. So each child will get 50% of their parental DNA, but it will be a different random mix than their siblings, unless they're twins. So if your sister has blonde hair and blue eyes and you have brown hair and green eyes, that's why you got each got a different random mix of your parents' DNA. So how does this help us in trying to identify uh, either in the case of adoptees, uh, their biological parents, or if we're trying to identify un unidentified human remains or a suspect, how is this helping? Well, let's look at the son. Um, he's got let's see, he's got this yellow segment of DNA here. So let's say he's done DNA testing and he matches with two people at the second cousin level. And I'll go over in a minute um, how you can tell how somebody is related to you based on the amount of matching DNA. But he's now got a second cousin match with these two people. So second cousins share a set of great grandparents. So here are the great grandparents up here. So let's say those two people are matching the sun on this yellow segment of DNA. Well, we can track up in our little diagram here and we can see that that yellow segment of DNA has come from this couple up here. So this is the set of great grandparents then would be the source of that, that yellow DNA. Um, and if we're doing this in terms of looking at genealogy, that's about as close as we could get that it's, it's a couple. Um, so if we now add to the mix an unknown person, and they are also matching as a second cousin on that yellow segment of DNA, what do we know about that person? Well, if, if the son and the two cousins who are, who are second cousins are all descendants of this set of great grandparents up here on the top left, we also know then that somebody else who is matching the same way must also be a descendant of that set of great grandparents. So now what we do when we're trying to identify somebody is we do what's called a reverse tree build. And we now identify all the descendants of that set of great grandparents, because we know that amongst those descendants must be the person that we're trying to identify. So there are different kinds of, of autosomal DNA that are actually used by law enforcement. One of them is the CODIS system um, that is run by the FBI. So this uses also autosomal DNA, but it uses a different kind of marker. It uses what are called short tandem repeats. Um, these, and these are the 20 uh, loci that are used or the alleles that are used. Um, and um, the difference in between the STRs that are used in the CODA system and what we use for, genetic, for investigative genetic genealogy um, is we use what are called SNPs for investigative genetic genealogy. So this then is what the STR looks like. In this particular case, we've got three nucleotides which are repeated multiple times. Um, a SNP, on the other hand, is a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a change in one single base in the structure of the DNA. And so here you've got, instead of uh, adenosine, you've got a thymine. Um, and so that is considered to be a SNP if it occurs in at least 1% of the population. So basically what you're looking for is the people who are most closely related to you, they're gonna have the same mutations that you have. So you're going to share more SNPs with somebody who's closely related to you than you do with somebody who's not particularly closely related. So I'm gonna go over some of the, the cases um, that I've worked on. Um, some of them you may already be familiar with. Um, probably most of you, if you're familiar with my work, um, uh, know about the Lisa Jensen case. Um, so I'm gonna go through that very briefly. Um, and the bottom line for her is that she's basically a living Jane Doe. She knows absolutely nothing about herself. So I became involved in the case when I was volunteering as a search angel with DNA adoption. And there was a, an email that came in um, 
to the website for DNA adoption from a deputy, Peter Headley in San Bernardino. And what he wanted to know was with, if the technique that we were using to help adoptees find their birth relatives, could that also be used to identify Lisa? And I told him yes, and I volunteered to work on that case. So this ended up being a rather complicated case instead of being a straightforward unknown parentage case where we identify who Lisa's parents are and everybody goes home happy. Uh, this one had a few twists and turns to it. So I was able to identify um, with the help of several volunteers. I started out with volunteers from uh, Moco Genso here in Monterey. And uh, then we expanded to including people from uh, who were actually genetic cousins of, of uh, Lisa. So we were able to identify who Lisa's mother was, a woman called Denise Bodan. And what we discovered was that Lisa and uh, her mother had never been reported missing. I had also identified some men who potentially were Lisa's uh, father. Um, However, it turned out that Lisa's grandfather, so this is um, Denise Bodin's father, is still alive. And so we asked him, who, who is Lisa's father? He said, Bob Evans. Well, Bob Evans was not one of the names that I'd come up with. So on a hunch, the deputy sent a picture of the man who had abducted Lisa to the grandfather. Yes, he said, that's Bob Evans. Well, this was not... Um, this was actually somebody who was going by about 14 or 15 other aliases. They were all stolen identities. He was an electrician uh, and he would work on home remodeling projects or other projects in people's homes. And he would at the same time help himself to their identity. So uh, his aliases were all actually real people. Um, he had actually gone to prison in California up in Contra Costa County. Uh, for murdering his common-law wife and son, June. Um, and there were some similarities in the ammo for her murder and the murder of four people in Allenstown, New Hampshire. So Eun Son June was killed by blunt force trauma. She was dismembered, wrapped in plastic, tied with electrical tape, and in her case, she was buried under 200 pounds of kitty litter in the basement of her home. The uh, people who were referred to as being the Allen's Town Four, they also had all been killed by blunt force trauma. And then let's take a look at the specifics of their cases here. So there were actually two steel drums that were discovered um, 15 years apart. In 1985, this first steel drum was discovered. It contained the bodies of this woman here and this little girl here, both killed with blunt force trauma, dismembered, tied with wrapped in plastic, tied with electrical tape, and then stuffed inside the steel drum. 15 years later, another drum was found in the same place in Bearbrook Park, actually not very far from where this first drum had been found. It contained the bodies of these two little girls, uh, again, killed by blunt force trauma. Uh, they were small, so they had not been dismembered, uh, but they were also wrapped in plastic, tied with electrical tape, and then stuffed inside this drum. So the New Hampshire State Police uh, followed the breadcrumbs and determined that, in fact, um, Bob Evans was, in fact, the murderer of the Allenstown Four. So, of course, one of the questions was, was this adult female, was this Denise Bodan? Um, no, she was not. But in running the DNA tests, what we discovered was that this little girl over here, um, she was actually the killer's daughter. So then we had a question, well, okay, if she's the killer's daughter, who is her mother? Is her mother also another victim? Uh, who are the Allenstown for? The New Hampshire State Police had done a lot of outreach into the community, trying to find people who knew who they were. And nobody had come forward. And then, of course, who, who is Bob Evans? Um, he's the man with the 14 or 15 aliases. So one of the questions was, can we, in fact, identify who the Allenstown Four are? 
we had tried multiple times to get DNA from um, the bodies. We had tried from tissue. We had tried from various organs, such as the liver, and we had tried from from bone uh, and teeth, and were totally unable to get uh, clean uh, human DNA. Uh, most of the DNA was bacterial DNA, so be about ninety eight percent bacterial DNA and only about two percent human. Yes, theoretically, you could amplify the human DNA. It would be very expensive and would probably not give a, a good product. So we had basically had come to a dead stop here as in terms of being able to identify these folks. In March of 2017, I had to have some surgery and uh, it took a while to recover from that. And of course, I'm sitting at home, I'm totally bored, and I'm surfing around on the internet. And I come across a newspaper article that was from the San Francisco Examiner. And there was an article in there about identifying a little girl who'd been found in a glass coffin in the basement of a home in San Francisco that was being renovated. I'm reading the article and the source of the DNA that was used was rootless hair. I am so excited. So this is uh, then a picture of the basement of the home and the, uh, the coffin that was discovered. And it turns out that back in the day, San Francisco moved all of their burial grounds out of the city to South San Francisco to an area called Colma. And they apparently missed some coffins. And using aerial photography, um, what they were able to do is determine that where this house was built was probably on the site where the Oddfellow Cemetery had been. And they were able to also to zero in and see possibly which, which grave had been the home. So um, reading the article, I discovered that uh, the person who was doing this, this work on the rootless hair is a guy called Dr. Ed Green at UC Santa Cruz. So I contacted Dr. Green and um, he told me that when he was working on this, what he did is they looked around for various relatives um, of that they believed might um, be a match with this person. They found a guy called Peter Cook and living in Marin. Um, and so this is not IgG. This is just doing a one-to-one -one comparison of DNA from uh, that had been extracted from the hair and then comparing that with um, DNA from Peter Cook. Uh, he's her great, he would have been her great nephew, and they were a match, so they were able to confirm uh, the relationship there. But of course, what was exciting to me was, hey, I have hair on all of my people from Allenstown. So um, I got together with Dr. Green. Uh, we uh, had lunch at the whole enchilada in Moss Landing, and we talked about him working on forensic samples, he was kind of excited to, to do something a little different. And so we then started to work on a protocol for being able to, to use this to identify the Allenstown 4. So we worked on this for several months um, and um, we got to a point where we had what we thought was a workable uh, situation. One of the things that of course was um, puzzling was why nobody had known that there was nuclear DNA in rootless hair. Um, it was known that there was mitochondrial DNA, but it was not known that there was nuclear DNA. So as the hair shaft is growing, the cells go through a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. And in that process, the nuclear DNA gets chopped up into little pieces. The pieces are really little. Um, on here, these, this is the base pairs of um, of the fragments. So the bulk of the fragments are in this 45 to 50 base pair range. The technology that's used for looking for DNA is the traditional method is PCR or polymerase chain reaction. It uses a couple of spacers, P5 and P7. They require a minimum size of 150 base pairs. So these fragments were too small to be picked up using traditional PCR technology. And that's why nobody knew that they were there. So um, Dr. Green then uh, developed a protocol for the hair. One of the things that was really um, helpful for the hair 
as I mentioned, with the other sources of DNA that we'd used, we'd run into a problem of, of really heavy contamination. The hair can be sterilized. You just put it in bleach and um, you sterilize it. The other big thing, of course, is if you have one hair, it's a single source of DNA. And this for forensic cases is actually very important because quite often um, you're working with sources of DNA that are not single source. So for example, if you're working on a rape kit, um, the sample may be contaminated with the victim's DNA in addition to the, the rapists, or there may have been more than one rapist. Um, so it's really nice to have um, a, so a source which you know that if you've got one hair and you extract the DNA from it, it's come from one place or one person. So in trying to sort out um, the use of this D the DNA then from the hair, we had actually some good samples that we could work with to make sure that we were getting real results. So we had, for example, we had the Allenstown ad adult female, and then the two children, we knew that they were mitochondrially related. So they, we knew that, they're, that they, through their maternal line, they were related to the adult female. The supposition being, of course, that they were her daughters, but we didn't know that for sure until we ran these tests. And then, of course, we had Rasmussen um, and uh, his daughter. So there are various tools that you can use to use the amount of matching DNA to estimate somebody's relationship. So what we wanted to be able to see then with the adult female and the two, two little girls and then Rasmussen and his daughter was we wanted to see a match that was a parent-child match. And that's typically around 3,500 centimorgans. The centimorgan being the uh, unit that's used for measuring the amount of matching DNA. Um, and there are other standards. So for example, full siblings, um, they would share about 2,600 centimorgans. Half siblings would share about 1,760. And in fact, when we tested the two little girls, it turns out they are actually half siblings. Um, but they do have a full parent-child match with the adult female. So um, meantime, uh, Janelle Davidson, uh, I don't know if Janelle's with us today, but Janelle and I worked on identifying who Bob Evans really was. So in his case, he had actually died in prison here in California um, in 2010. And it turns out that California actually autopsies its deceased prisoners. And so we were able to get a blood card from the autopsy and uh, isolate DNA from that um, and use that then to determine who he really was. And it turned out his, his real name was Terry Pater Rasmussen, uh, and he was originally from Colorado. So then we continue on. We identified then the Allenstown 4 using the um, DNA from the hair. Um, and we were able to identify the adult female as Marilise Honeychurch. Uh, the eldest child was Marie Vaughan. The youngest child was Sarah McWhorters. And as I mentioned, they were half siblings, uh, according to the matches. Um, around the same time as we were doing this, there was somebody else who, um, with the information uh, on who Rasmussen was, uh, had also come up with a, an hypothesis that the adult female had been uh, Marilise Honeychurch. However, um, without the DNA from the hair, there was no way to actually have confirmed that. So it worked out all the way around. We had a couple of independent ways then of, of identifying these people. We are still working on identifying uh, the, young, the little girl who was Rasmussen's daughter. So let's talk about some of the other cases that I worked on. This is probably one of my favorite cases. Um, it just was a very satisfying case to work on. It was one that I actually was able to solve and I think it was 48 hours. Um, it was just one of those cases where everything came together the right way. So that's in contrast to looking at the Allenstown folk where Rasmussen's daughter, where we still haven't identified who she is. We're talking now, uh, we've been working on that case for, well, it must, must be about five years. So, uh, well, actually, it's not, no, excuse me, it's three years because uh, that was when we had the hair, uh, the, the hair available. 
So the billboard boy was, um, he, his skeletonized remains were found under a billboard um, along the highway uh, in Meebane, North Carolina. He was estimated to be 10 to 12 years old uh, and he was, his race was estimated to be probably either Caucasian or Hispanic. And then this is the sign that marked where his body had been found. So one of the first things that I always do when I'm working on cases is there are tools on both uh, GEDmatch and fa uh, Family Tree DNA that allow you to estimate the admixture or bio ancestry for the person that you're trying to identify. So this one had a big surprise. Um, it turned out that he was not Caucasian or Hispanic. He was actually half Caucasian and half Asian. So you can see here he's got um, very large amounts of uh, Caucasian ancestry, and then he's also got then uh, very large amounts of Asian uh, ancestry. So, and the other thing that was helpful here is that a Y-DNA haplotype had actually been done uh, on him, and it was R1B, which of course is one of the most common uh, haplotypes for white males. So I knew then that the, it was the father that was white and his mother that was Asian. So then we got the results in from GEDmatch uh, with his matches. And he had a first cousin once removed match, 458.8 centimorgans. So th this was kind of an interesting case because when I first started working on it, it was the end of November uh, of 2018. And when the detective called me about the case, um, so this is a 20 year old cold case. And he said he was gonna be retiring at the end of the year and was there any way that I could solve this case before the end of the year? And so I told him, well, yeah, I would sure try. Um, and suddenly it looked like we were actually gonna be able to do that. Because what this meant was that a, if if uh, a sibling of the person who was the uh, the parent of the match um, had a uh, biracial child, that biracial child was going to be uh, our little boy under the billboard. So I called the detective and gave him that information. Um, and so he called that person and their response was, well, yeah, um, my brother was stationed in uh, Korea and come to think of it, haven't seen little Bobby in a while. And so of course, um, this did in fact turn out to be little Bobby. Um, and apparently the family had been told uh, by the, the boy's father that Bobby and his mom had gone back to Korea. So the problem was, if this was Bobby, where was mom? So the, um, with all the time that it takes for, for doing confirmations and so on, this was actually confirmed in uh, February of 2019. So it turned out that in fact, uh, there had been an Asian woman's body had been found uh, about 200 miles away uh, across the state line uh, in Spartanburg, South Carolina. But because Bobby was thought to be either Caucasian or Hispanic, nobody had connected him with the body of an Asian woman that was found uh, in South Carolina. So of course, now knowing that he was half Asian, suddenly they were looking at her as being possibly his mother. And of course, um, in testing her, um, she was in fact Bobby's mother. So uh, this is Bobby and his mom. It turned out his father, who was uh, of course the prime suspect in this was actually already in prison for uh, a number of holdups at ATMs. Um, he initially refused to do uh, any DNA testing, um, but his relatives were so outraged that he had lied to them about what had happened to uh, Bobby and his mom, 
that they finally prevailed upon him and uh, he ended up confessing to having killed his son and his wife. Um, he was already serving a, a term uh, for the robberies, um, which runs until two, 2037. Um, he's now been sentenced to an additional two consecutive terms of 26 to 32 years for each of those murders that will then run after the 2037 uh, when he served his robbery sentence. So let's take a look at the Golden State Killer. So the announcement of, of the arrest of, of, at least of the um, identification of Bob Evans as being the murderer of the Ellis Town Four from uh, trying to identify who Lisa Jensen's parents were was unusual enough. It, it made a lot of headlines uh, in various publications. And one of those was Forensic Magazine, which ran a, a fairly big story on, um, on this whole uh, scenario. And so one of the people who, who saw that story was Paul Holes. And so uh, next thing I know, I am getting a phone call from Paul Holes asking me if I would be willing to work on one of his cold cases with him. So of course, uh, this, this uh, is how I got involved in with working on this case. What was interesting is that even though it, so, so, well, so we, we talk about that we solved it in the 63 days. The reason that we, we use that particular reference um, from the time that we uploaded the DNA profile to GEDmatch is because it actually took us five months to actually get to that point. Um, it turned out when, when I got together with, with Paul Holes that um, he didn't have any DNA. There had been three, three of the GSK's uh, rapes had been in Contra Costa County, but he'd gone through his DNA. Um, you know, he'd been working on this for 22 years and each time new technology became available um, for uh, that would potentially help solve the case, of course, he would take out his little vial of DNA and he would use some of the DNA. And of course, he'd now used it all up and he didn't have any left. So, um, I'm behind on my slides here. So the problem is then finding some DNA. So there were over 50 rapes. So it's not as though there was not a lot of DNA that had been available, um, but a lot of other jurisdictions had done the same thing as, um, as Paul had done, or they had DNA left that they were unwilling to give it up. So, um, we were sort of going down the list of all the counties that, that potentially had DNA. And one of the last on the list um, was Ventura County. And so Paul contacted uh, Ventura County and asked if they had any DNA. And instead of saying no, or no, you can't have any, they said, we'll check. And they called back a day or so later and they have very good news for us. Not only do they have DNA, they have an entire sexual assault kit that has been sitting in their freezer unopened for 38 years. So we were able to get our hands on totally pristine DNA. It passed all of the quality control tests with flying colors. Um, it turned out that uh, Dr. Peter Speth, who was their medical examiner, um, he had a technique where he always took two samples when he was doing a rape kit. He would do two kits. He didn't just do one. And he would use one for doing his tests. And then the other one, he would just put in the freezer and not use it for anything. So now our next problem was we needed a SNP profile uh, to upload to Family Tree DNA and to GEDmatch. The only companies that had the technology available to do SNP profiles were the direct-to-consumer testing companies, Ancestry, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA. And Steve and Paul went hat in hand to Ancestry and 23andMe, and they told them absolutely not. And then they went to Family Tree DNA, 
And Bennett Greenspan, the CEO of Family Tree DNA, said, yes, we will do that. It's the right thing to do. And so uh, we were then able to get a SNP profile. So all of that took us about five months. Um, of course, we still had to get the DNA extracted from the sample that we'd um, obtained from Ventura County. Um, and this was from the rape homicide of uh, Charlene Smith. So on the 14th of February, 2018, uh, Steve Kramer uploaded that file to Family Tree DNA, and I uploaded it to GEDmatch. So then, of course, we had to, to wait uh, and see what we were going to get. Um, I think we all logged in a gazillion times a day to see if the matching had taken place yet because it was on, on GEDmatch now, it takes overnight. Um, Family Tree DNA still takes a, a few days, but um, back then it, it took a while. And so we keep logging in to, to see if our matching has happened. Um, so the matching is actually done by an algorithm that, that goes through and compares the different profiles in the database. Um, looking to see which which profiles actually share uh, DNA, and then it prints out a list of the people that that share DNA with uh, your particular sample. Um, it gives you uh, a list with names, uh, email addresses, the amount of shared DNA, and the um, estimated relationship. So while we're waiting. Um, I decided I wanted to know a little bit more about the person that I'm trying, going to be trying to find. So uh, there is actually some utilities on the, the uh, GEBmatch site, which I could use uh, to get some information. Um, and also there was a site called Prometheus, where you could upload a file and get uh, various uh, information about phenotype. So both of those sites uh, told me that uh, the Golden State Killer had blue eyes. Um, and I also looked at uh, some of the alleles that are associated with baldness, uh, pattern baldness, and uh, determined that not only was he likely to be bald, but he was likely to be prematurely bald. So the profile then that I had ended up putting together um, while I'm waiting for the, the matching to take place is I have some information in about his admixture or uh, bioancestry. Um, it's partly North Atlantic and Baltic and uh, some Mediterranean. The first um, rape that we were aware of was from 1976. So assuming that he was at least 20 years old at that time, he was probably born in 1956 or earlier. Um, the earliest rape had all taken place in Northern California and the Citrus Heights area of Sacramento. So he probably lived in California, probably Northern California. It was estimated that he had blue eyes and likely was bald. So what were we hoping for as we're waiting and logging in? Uh, a gazillion times to see what our matches are. What we're hoping for is a second cousin match or better. So what exactly does a second cousin match look like? So you start with your match. Second cousins are uh, typically share, well, they do share a set of great grandparents. So if we're looking then at our tree, <clears throat> if we've got our match over here, uh, we're going up we're to, to his uh, eight, well, his four sets of great grandparents here, and then we've got another four over here. So um, and we've got the second cousin. Um, and if they're sharing one set, then of those eight sets of great grandparents up here, um, or at least those eight, grand, eight great grandparents you have up here, they're sharing um, one set. So as you recall, when we were talking about um, the mixing and matching of the DNA, what we're now going to want to do once we've identified who the common ancestors are, is we're then going to look for all of the descendants of that set of great grandparents in order to identify who the, the Golden State Killer is. 
So how, how lucky do we have to be to get our second cousins? So most people have between five and eight first cousins and maybe 25 to 40 second cousins. I know I don't have anything like that many, but um, I know some people do. And of course, for any of you who've done DNA testing, you'll know that you've got lots of third and fourth cousins. So what is the chance of actually getting a second cousin match? So the US population is around 327 million. So if you have a database, which is 1% of that, so it has 3 million people in it, you've got a 58% chance of matching a second cousin. Of course, that goes up if you then have a larger uh, sample uh, of the population. So if we look at the size of the different databases, <clears throat> the top one here in green is ancestry DNA. There are about 20 million people in that database. Uh, if you look at uh, 23andMe, you're looking at about 12 and a half million. But if you come down here and look at family tree DNA and GEDmatch, you're instead you're looking at maybe around 2 million. And in fact, for GEDmatch, um, where most of the people have been opted out at one point from law enforcement matching, I believe it's now more like around 350 or 400,000 people that are actually available for law enforcement matching. So we're only talking about 0.1% in terms of uh, the coverage for um, getting a second cousin match. So if we're looking then at what we're going to see, if we get a second cousin match, we're hoping for something around 240 centimorgans. So our matches came in. Our biggest match on GEDmatch was 62.2 centimorgans, and they went down from there. So unfortunately, 62.2 centimorgans is probably either a third or a fourth cousin. It actually turned out to be a third cousin, um, but it was not quite what we had in mind uh, for our matching. So, uh, but that's what we had. Um, so we just had to knuckle down and decide, well, um, it's not quite what we had hoped for, but it just means we're gonna have to build a few more trees. So we built uh, then a speculative family tree um, based on the largest match that we had. Um, and then to that, we added others. We actually build what we call a super tree. And so rather than building individual trees for individual matches, we actually have them all in one giant folder. And so basically we've got a main, a main match, which is the closest match. And then we have um, several, what we call floaters. Um, and then when we can, we will connect those trees. Um, in the meantime, uh, they're all sitting in the same database. Um, we hope at some point to be able to connect some of those trees so that we will be able to identify our most recent common ancestor. And then once we're able to do that, of course, we'll do a reverse build to identify all the descendants. So 15th of February, 2018 was when we got matches and we could start uh, actually starting to build trees. Uh, there was a tool that was available on the DNA GEDCOM client called the Autosomal DNA Segment Analyzer that we used, it was a wonderful tool. There were not very many tools available. So none of the wonderful tools that we use now um, to make life so easy um, were available back then. That was one of the few that was. Um, and at that point we had actually built, and this is when we were building individual trees, um, we had actually built about 25 trees. So this wasn't looking too good. We weren't seeing, even though, so all six of us were basically working around the clock. Um, Paul Holes was going to be retiring. And so we were hoping that we would be able to solve this case before he retired. Um, but none of these trees looked like they were going to connect to one another. Um, and so um, around the 25th of February of 2018, um, I had an account at MyHeritage uh, which also accepts uploads. And at the time, their uh, terms of service did not prohibit upload of a forensic file. Uh, they do now, but they did not then. Um, and so I talked to Steve Kramer and um, he agreed that that sounded like an option was let's see if we can get some better matches uh, on the MyHeritage site.
So on the uh, 28th of February, the match and ethnicity uh, information was posted on MyHeritage for our file. And there was our second cousin match. So just to explain their, their page here. So we've got the GSK over here, and here's the match at 244.8 centimorgans. Um, then on the side, then it shows how much matching DNA there is with other people, and then how much DNA matching DNA those people have with our match. So there is a second match here uh, at 138 centimorgans. If we go over here, we see that that is actually the daughter of this match up here. What was really interesting was if you then look at the rest of the matches, they look like the matches that we have on Family Tree DNA and on GEDmatch, 40.3, 10.6, 18.3. The only matches of any size were this mother and her daughter. So we built out a tree for our uh, MyHeritage match. Um, so we built this out, and then as we're building it out, uh, we recognize this name here, uh, this Ada Seeley. We had built a tree for, this was uh, our match on Family Tree DNA, it was uh, 52 centimorgans. And uh, when we were building out that, we had also come across Ada Seeley. So if we're looking here, then uh, we've got match A, um, which is built out. Uh, to uh, back here to three times great grandparents, uh, Ada Seeley, and then a match now from, from my heritage where we're at the uh, great grandmother le level. Uh, so this was the second cousin match again with Ada Seeley. So suddenly we had a most recent common ancestor in Ada Seeley. So um, at that point, then we uh, started building down. Um, and there, as I mentioned, there were not very many tools that were available. Um, and so really, in order to try and figure out who were maybe our suspects, um, the only thing I could come up with to do was to actually run kinship reports. So this is a list of people who are a certain relationship to the matches that we have. So for example, I ran a kinship report um, looking for the second cousins matching to our match that was on uh, my heritage. So I got a list of all of the, the men who were um, matching at the second cousin level and who were born in the right time frame. Um, I also ran uh, a similar list then for the match from uh, Family Tree DNA. Again, so in that case, looking at people who were third cousins to the match from Family Tree DNA. Um, and were also then born in the right time frame. And I found that there were nine men who were common to both of those lists. So this, this was then um, the very first time that we actually had a suspect list for the Golden State Color. So going through the list, Kirk Campbell um, looked, looked at these folks and they, uh, and he and um, Monica then went through looking at what some of these people did. And what they discovered was that there actually was one of these men met, actually met the profile that Paul had put together. Um, he, and he had actually done a four part uh, documentary documentary series that had been aired on television, actually right as we were beginning to work on the case. And because a number of the rapes in the Citrus Heights area in Sacramento had taken place in new housing developments, Paul had a theory that the GSK was potentially somehow involved in real estate. Maybe he was a real estate developer, or maybe he was an agent, or um, maybe even in something like construction. And there was one of these nine men actually fit their profile. So we had a lot of discussion about that and then uh, eventually decided that why don't we go ahead and test this person. So um, 
Paul then contacted somebody who was a close relative to this, this man who met the profile. And uh, we tested her and the results came back um, that uh, number one, she had an X chromosome match and she was a second cousin. So with the X chromosome match, men have only one X chromosome. And so if you have a, an X chromosome match with a male, then you know that that matching is on the maternal side of that person's tree. So we now knew that the uh, Ada Seeley was related to the GSK through one of his maternal lines. So we can then build our tree out, and this then is looking at the maternal side of the tree. So let's go back then and uh, look at our profile that we have. Because of the X match, I was actually able to eliminate three more men from our list. There were three men who could not possibly have an X chromosome match um, with the GSK, um, now that we knew which side of his tree was which. Um, so what else did we have that we could use to see if we could uh, now whittle this, this list of six men down to one? Well, one of the things, of course, that I had identified um, about him was he theoretically had blue eyes. So uh, the uh, FBI pulled uh, the uh, California driver's license records for these six men. One man had blue eyes. That was Joseph D'Angelo. So this is now what our tree looked like. Um, we had Joseph D'Angelo. Uh, we had had a number of Italian matches. And if you remember from our uh, admixture or bio ancestry, uh, there was some, a fair amount of Mediterranean uh, ancestry, um, which then fit in with uh, the last name D'Angelo, which was uh, presumably Italian. And so then this was now what uh, the tree looked like for uh, Joseph D'Angelo. So of course, the, uh, the, the rest of the story, everybody already knows, um, he was put under surveillance. The uh, law enforcement then, what he, they trailed him to a shopping center. Uh, and after he went into the mall, uh, his car door handle was swabbed. That DNA was then compared against crime scene DNA. And it was a gazillion to one odds that it could be anybody else um, was the Golden State Killer. Um, because this was such an important case, they actually did a second sample. Um, a tissue was retrieved from uh, his trash when he put his trash out at the curb. Uh, DNA from the tissue was run, and again, gazillion to one odds that it could be anybody else. So um, I would like to make a Quick plea to all of you, uh, if any of you would like to help law enforcement, um, you can help by, uh, if you've not already done DNA testing, test at one of the direct -to consumer companies, doesn't matter which one. Um, you then download your file from wherever you've tested, upload it to uh, Family Tree DNA uh, or test at Family Tree DNA and uh, also upload to GEDmatch and opt into law enforcement. Encourage your friends and family to test and do the same thing. Um, and this will then make the databases bigger and help us with, with solving cases. For those of you who would like to know more about uh, some of the cases that I've worked on, uh, I do have a book that came out in February, um, which is available on Amazon. And uh, if you still have local bookstores, um, it may also be in your local bookstores. Thank you. And I'll open up for questions. All right, if you have any questions, uh, please enter them into the Q&A field. It's down there on the Zoom control bar. You'll see that little Q&A icon. There's two little speech bubbles. Barbara, that was so amazing. This is one of the most favorite, this is one of my most favorite program I've ever run and I've run hundreds. This is so exciting. Anyway, okay. It says, when was mitochondria DNA discovered? <laughs> um, I have no idea. It's a good question.
I sort of thought you would say that. All right. It says, what kind of information are typically embedded in mitochondria DNA? Did you say hair color? Mitochondria? No, mitochondrial DNA. So the mitochondria are actually the little power packs for your cells. Um, it's actually a separate organelle in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, and so actually one of the very interesting things, um, since we are in the era of COVID, is people who have long COVID they uh, frequently have damage to their mitochondria, which would explain why they have just overwhelming fatigue is because their little power packs have been, have been damaged. Can DNA technology be used to identify the age of a person from a single strand of hair? The age of a person? <laughs> That's These what the very... question reads, so. <laughs> These are very sophisticated questions. Um, so there is relatively recent work that's being done trying to determine age of people, but it's not from hair. Um, it's um, using bones um, to try, and I believe it's looking at things like phosphates and other um, minerals and trying to, to uh, use those to identify you know, somebody's age, because obviously that's a very important question, um, but we're not quite there yet, I don't think. All right, your next question says, how common is it to use non-rooted hair for DNA and is it very expensive? So um, Dr. Green has actually set up a company in Santa Cruz called Australia Forensics, um, and they are they actually are getting a lot of, of requests. If you think about it, um, in fact, it's kind of interesting. I went to a presentation that Dr. Green was giving to law enforcement. They were on the edges of their seat, even if they didn't understand most of what he was talking about, because he was you know, heavily going into the science. But what is, what is found at crime scenes? It's hair, and it doesn't conveniently have the root attached uh, most of the time. And so actually it's a, a, an important part of, of uh, forensics to be able to, to get DNA from a hair. So it's actually, there are a number of cases that are coming up where that's the only thing that's available. There was there've been a couple of cases, one recently um, that I worked on with, again, with the GSK team, it was a rape homicide of a little girl out of Nampa in Idaho. Um, and the, evidence in that case had been lost. I can't remember if it was a fire or something had happened and most of the evidence had been lost, but there was a single male pubic hair that had been recovered from the little girl's body. Dr. Green was able to get sufficient DNA out of that single hair for us to identify uh, a suspect. Um, and in fact, that case has, uh, there was a hearing uh, and Dr. Green had to go to it because in this particular case, there is no DNA in CODIS. This is the only evidence is this one hair. Um, and so he then had to testify as to, you know, how it would, how he could then you know, draw the conclusions that we were drawing from the DNA from that hair. Um, and there've been a number of other cases and I've, I've personally solved several cases now using hair. So it's actually become very important. This just couldn't be more interesting to me. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, next question says, what resources do you recommend for those of us who want to learn to do what you do? Um, well, that's a good question. There are, um, so there is, so DNA adoption still offers their uh, beginning uh, autosomal DNA class. I've, um, I normally do the more advanced one, and I've been kind of overwhelmed with one thing and another. Um, and so that one has actually been on hold. I'm hoping to get some breathing space to go back and do some more with that again, because that was a very popular class. Um, there are some good books. Um, there's a book by Blaine Battinger, um, which goes in. So these are not looking so much at the forensics, but just learning the basic um, technology and how to do um, you know, just research in this area, uh, a way to get some experience would be to work, would be to volunteer with one of the groups that does unknown parentage. And I think most of us doing investigative genetic genealogy, that's actually how we started, is we started out doing, you know, helping people who are adoptees um, or other people who are, who have unknown parentage, figure out who their parents are. It's exactly the same technique. 
um, all you're doing is in one case you're identifying somebody's parents like I was trying to do for Lisa um, or um, you're flipping it around and you're trying to identify an unknown person um, whether it's a suspect or whether it's uh, the uh, unknown remains so th those are good ways to get to get some experience um, there are some fairly expensive classes that are out there I have not taken them or and I don't know how good they are um, that's but I would at least start with trying to do some of the unknown parentage stuff and learn some of the basics of doing that kind of research. Great, thank you. Uh, another question says, didn't British geneticist Brian Sykes discover mitochondrial DNA doing his research? Sykes was the author of uh, Seven Daughters of Eve. He passed away recently, a couple of years ago. Not sure if you can speak to that. Well, that's actually a good guess. Um, I still don't know the answer, but um, if somebody's been able to, to Google that, that sounds about right. All right. It says, I think this is to the GSK. It says, do we know why he stopped killing? We don't know for 100% that he did. Um, if, if, if he didn't, he probably changed his MO. Um, it would be unusual for him to stop. I'll put it that way. Um, I worked on another case. Um, was somebody who was a serial rapist. This was the Clearfield rapist out of Utah. And uh, after I identified who he was, he was a long haul trucker. And uh, after he was arrested, he then started confessing to some other crimes. And it turns out that he had a great many additional rapes that he had, that he had um, done and also several murders. Um, so we thought he had stopped, but um, he hadn't. He just changed his trucking route and changed his MO. So it's it's a good question as to whether he actually really did stop or not. And you spoke to this a little bit, but the question did come in. It says, if you upload your DNA results to any of the sites, are there limits on law enforcement use? Um, yeah. So, of course, back when we did GSK, there weren't any limits. Um, and so... Um, the limitation, of course, to trying to get anything into either 23andMe or Ancestry was that for those companies, you need to spit in a tube. Um, and GSK wasn't going to be spitting into any tubes. So we were limited to uploading to the sites that allowed uploads of a DNA profile. Um, after GSK, those sites all changed their terms of service uh, to not allow upload of uh, or submission of a forensic sample. Um, GEDmatch changed its terms of service to only allow certain kinds of, of crimes to be um, the type of, of files that you could upload. And they've changed them several times. Um, right now, it's violent crimes that include, I believe it's aggravated rape, murder, um, and there's, I think, abduction and maybe something else in there. They keep changing them. Uh, Family Tree DNA, I think their uploads are limited to um, either rape, it's not aggravated, it's just rape, um, and then abduction, and of course, violent crimes like, like murder. So it depends on the site. There are also some other limitations in terms of, I think, both Chedmatch and uh, Family Tree DNA require that you are also satisfying the guidelines that were put out by the FBI. Uh, those guidelines require that the file be uh, have an upload to uh, CODIS. And so it becomes an issue then if there's not an upload to CODIS, um, is, you know, what are you going to do in those kind of scenarios? So there, there are various and sundry limitations on doing this. I personally think that there should be some kind of a um, mechanism where if you have a situation of what's called imminent harm, that there be maybe some kind of a judicial review where you could look and see, is this something where there could maybe be a uh, judicial order issued to allow upload of, of a file? The cases that come to mind, there was one, in fact, this one prompted everybody getting opted out of GEDmatch. Uh, it was a case where an elderly woman had been practicing the organ in her church and she was attacked by a young man. She was left for dead. She was not raped and she wasn't killed. 
And so she didn't meet the criteria for, for an upload of her file and of, a, of her attacker's file to GEDmatch. Um, GEDmatch approved the upload. Um, and then when people found out that that had happened and was in violation of the terms of service, uh, everybody got opted out um, of, of GEDmatch and everybody then had to opt in. Um, there was another case more recently um, of a woman who had been, I think it was somebody in in, uh, in Hollywood who was being stalked and she and her daughter had been stalked for something like 13 years. Um, she was afraid both for her own life and for her daughter's life. Um, and so somebody who was working on that case uploaded the file for that perpetrator. And of course, it again caused outrage because this was not within the terms of service. So it seems to me that we need to have a mechanism where if you've got truly egregious situations which aren't quite fitting into the terms of service as they are, that maybe there's a way to uh, get a waiver on those. It, was it a long makes time. me uh, think about the statistics on uh, strangulation, mm -hmm. to, you know, and the uh, possibility that they go on to commit a much more severe crime. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll find uh, some sort of solution in there somewhere. All right, um, let's see. Next question. Other than DNA uploads, are there other ways genealogists can help? Um, well, um, you can, if you are interested in trying to, to learn how to do stuff, then yeah, you can certainly start helping uh, people doing unknown parentage. When you feel that you are somewhat proficient, you might even want to volunteer with your local police department. Um, but uh, I would only do that if you feel pretty confident that you know what you're doing. Um, somebody who's got a lot of experience in doing uh, family history research, so long as they have, have learned how to do the reverse build, which is more difficult, um, then they could probably be an asset to law enforcement. We have another question that says, how willing are people to be DNA tested if there is reason to believe they can help in a case? What's the approach and who speaks to these people? So there are a few um, situations where, uh, I mean, the one that comes to mind is the one out of uh, Oklahoma, where they're trying to identify people uh, from the massacre there. Um, where they're, they actually, I think, have, I don't know if they set up a separate database or whether they were trying to use GEDmatch, um, but there are some, some uh, projects where you can, can donate to a specific database. And I think there are a couple of companies that have set up databases as well, which could be used that are not generally open to the public. You may not know the answer to this question, but it says, was CC more involved in unraveling the GSK or am I confusing it with another case? You're confusing it with another case. Sorry, Annette, won't be able to answer that one. Let's see, uh, then this will be the last question, I think. It says what the person would just like you to repeat the name of Dr. Green's company and the type of work that his lab does. Sure, um, so, well, there, there are two different things. So his company is Australia Forensics. Uh, they're in Santa Cruz. And so they primarily work on hair and uh, bone. Um, his lab at the university um, is a paleo, paleo something of the other lab. Um, they actually work on things like dinosaur bones and bison um, and other kind of interesting things. Um, so two, two very different labs. The, the technology, of course, he's obviously very good at working on things that are old. Um, and the old being sort of relative here, whether you're talking about dinosaurs or whether you're talking about old bones from... Um, a, an excavation of, of a body. Um, but one of the things, and in fact, I'm, I think that they started doing this, um, and there's another company also, I believe, that does this, but uh, I think at the beginning you mentioned keepsake type things, mementos, and I, I remember my mother and my grandmother had little lockets with hair in them, and um, I think, I'm not sure if Dr. Green's lab, or at least whether the company for rent, the um, Australia actually will do keepsake type things, but I know there is a company that is doing that. Um, and so if you wanted to get DNA from whatever relative whose hair you have, that might be an option. It's fairly expensive. So the forensic samples uh, typically, I think, run around $5,000 or $6,000. 
I don't know if it would be any less for, for doing a memento type um, sample or not. But they're right there in town. Barbara, again, thank you so much. This has been such an honor to run this program. Uh, Gail, we are out of time. And as, as, as sad as I am to say, we do need to go back to you. <laughs> Barbara, thank you for this insanely interesting presentation about your pioneering use of investigative genetic genealogy. What a fascinating view into how you develop your unique methodology and your ongoing work to identify the dead and zero in on their slayers. And Sarah, I'm gonna ask you if you could repeat the instructions about how people can access the links to um, that I had sent you earlier today in the on the registration page. Sure, give me just a second. Thanks. Okay, so if you go to the page that we had today where you originally came and registered on our Santa Cruz Public Library's event calendar, you scroll down a little bit and you'll see a gray box. And here, I'll make it a little bit larger. You'll see attachments. So once you click on this, this is a PDF. And so this is all of the attachments that Barbara was kind enough to provide. And then you'll be able to have those. So you don't need to worry about going back and finding it in the save chat or anything like that. They're all right here. And I'll put the event link in the chat again. Thank you, Sarah. And I want to thank all of you for being with us for today's program. I hope you will join us again on the first Tuesday of June, June 6th at 1 p.m. for the presentation by Kathy Nielsen, who will explain what to do with our family research in heirlooms. And you can register to receive the Zoom link through the Santa Cruz Public Library's events calendar on this same page that Sarah just showed you. And we also invite you to join the Genealogy Society. Uh, we are always eager to welcome new members. You can, uh, we're at scgensoc.org. And when you visit our website, you will find the membership application form there. We look forward to welcoming new members. And I think we're more or less done. <laughs> thank everyone for being here today. And Barbara, thank you again for a really fascinating presentation. Well, thank you for inviting me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. I'll get the recording up as soon as I can. Okay. Thank you, Sarah and Victor, for your help.